For my 10 minutes of history presentation, I will be exploring the life and work of Dr. Margaret Kenner. Dr. Kenner was born September 25, 1899 in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. She attended Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania and graduated in 1922. Following her graduation, she moved to Ithaca, New York to attend Cornell for medical school, where she graduated 12th in her class in 1930. It is noted that while she was in medical school, her research focus was primarily on plasmas and proteins in the body. After graduating, she interned at Strong Hospital in Rochester, New York. Her first job at a residency was an unpaid position at the Laboratory of Physiology at Yale. She was later offered a paid research assistant position that came with the rank of assistant professor. and She stayed in that position from 1933 to 1937. During this time, she was awarded a Rockefeller Traveling Fellowship, which she used to travel to both Amsterdam and Breslau to continue her research. Her big contributions to the field, namely the research on factors that affect performance, both motor and cognitive, following brain damage, were conducted during this time. Prior to moving to Yale, Dr. Kenner applied by writing to Dr. John F. Fulton to join his lab in 1931. Along with her application, her references were significant for support not only for her cognitive abilities and intellect, but also for her looks, which was annoyingly common for the time. Stanley Cobb at Harvard Medical School wrote, and I quote, she's an unusually able girl. She is tall, of a wiry New York type, and has a lot of energy. I would call her attractive without being a Venus, end quote. Regardless, Dr. Fulton was excited to have Dr. Kenner come work with him, although it was noted that he did not have the funds to financially support her. So she worked unpaid for the first year as an honorary research fellow, then was promoted to a research assistant with an instructor's rank and a following stipend. She was promoted to assistant professor in 1933, which came along with a yearly stipend of $1,200. In 1934, she received a raise and bringing her yearly stipend to $3,000. During Dr. Kenner's time in Europe, she worked at the National Hospital, Queen Square in London, and at the London Hospital. In 1935, she was elected to the Royal Society in London, which is known as the oldest national scientific institution in the world. Its roles include promoting science, recognizing excellence in science, and informing policies through scientific evidence. In 1942, Dr. Kenner passed her specialty boards in both neurology and psychiatry, making her a certified physician. From there, she would go on to become an associate professor of psychiatry at NYU and concurrently an active physician at Bellevue Hospital. Her final held position was at an additional professorship at the University of British Columbia as a professor of physiology. Continuing on with her work under the Rockefeller Traveling Fellowship, Dr. Kenner continued to work at a variety of hospitals, including Children's Hospital in Boston with Dr. Bronson Cothers. After her time at Yale, when her fellowship was over, she served in multiple capacities as director of Washington State Mental Health Research Institute, president for the Society of Biological Psychiatry, vice president for the American Neurological Society, and continued to work as a psychiatrist in New England. She would later pass away in 1975 from complications from ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Circling back to her work at Yale, she began by uh, researching motor functions of the adult frontal cortex, as she is quoted as saying the motor function has the most obvious symptoms when compared to other syndromes that are a result of injury elsewhere in the brain. Her early work was on how lesions affect the posture, grasping, and perseveration, as well as motor representation of the autonomic system in the premotor area, mostly focused on adults. 
However, as luck would have it, Fulton's lab was down the hall from the experimental OBGYN projects that were being conducted on monkeys at the time. These doctors offered newborn monkeys to Kenner and other lab members as a sort of peace offering between the multiple labs. Kenner took leadership on these projects that examined monkeys and lesions and would eventually forever change the trajectory of her career. The first paper from this, these experiments was published in 1936 and it examined the behavioral effects of the cortical lesions on monkeys. This paper in particular showed the difference between two infant macaque monkeys. One who had its left motor and premotor codices ablaged at 10 days old and the other having its entire left hemisphere removed at 40 days old. A pivotal finding for the study was that both these monkeys behaved oddly similar to monkeys who had never been operated on. But more importantly, these monkeys did not look like monkeys who had been operated on at years old. These images show a monkey who has a frontal lesion at an older age which was roughly one year old. Prior to the surgery, this monkey was already cortically dependent, but shows paresis after the lesion. See the red arrows to see the spastic position of the right arm. This spastic position observation was pivotal for Dr. Kenner's research. She hypothesized that the lack of deficits following the immature motor cortex lesions were because those areas had not been fully developed in infant or younger monkeys. A build off of this hypothesis was that if the lesion was in an area where the brain was already developed, the deficits would be similar to regardless of the age. This would later be known as the Kennard Principle. Here is a quote from her 1942 paper explaining these findings further. There are, in contrast, two functions of the cortex which we know to be totally destroyed by ablation both in the infant and in the adult. Vision is as completely and permanently altered by bilateral ablation of the occipital lobes of the infant as of the adult. Complete removal of the areas 9 through 12 also produce in both infant and adult an animal incapable of immediate memory. It may be assumed in these instances that all of the systems necessary for these functions have been destroyed and that there is no vicarious assumption of function. The Kennard Principle states that the brain damage sustained early in life is less debilitating than the brain damage sustained later in life, as you can see from this graph. This is presumably because of the enhanced ability of the younger brain to reorganize. This would be known as the largest contribution of Kenner's career. However, even after finding these results, Kenner had a yearning to do more applied work, specifically working with children. After a number of years at Yale studying behavioral changes and the variables related to them, specifically how they change after brain damage, Kenner sought academic stimulation by working with children who suffered from cerebral palsy and who had survived motor accidents. Some argue that this shift to child work was a random change in Dr. Kenner's career. However, here is a quote from a letter that Kenner wrote to a close colleague and friend, and I quote, do you think that there is a need for children's neurologists in America, in New Haven, Boston, etc.? I don't think that enough is known about the subject. The children fall between the adult neurologist and the pediatrician. As you may remember, I took all the child patients I could find in Fox's clinic. I've talked to everyone I could find on the subject, and everyone agrees that there's a possible need for such specialists. As far as I know, Cothers and Bailey's clinics are the only one with children neurologists, but I'm sure there are more. Reasons I would like to do it are as many. The neurology of children's diseases is more neurophysiology than anything else. I'm very interested in spasticity, paresis, developmental conditions. I'm not really a physiologist. So, why do we remember Margaret Kenner? In addition to her work on brain damage in animals, 
She also contributed by working with children with cerebral palsy and motor accidents. She made a lot of important contributions to the field and they go beyond just the Kenner's principle. First and foremost, she made significant contributions to our understanding of brain damage and an extremely timely point in our country's history as the World War was underway at the time. She was also part of a team that showed that sparing and recovering brain damaged adult animals. In addition to the brain damage research she had done, she also researched certain drugs, stimulants, and depressants, namely, and how they affect behavioral and cognitive performances after brain damage. Her research and work can be applied to so many different fields, and it's important to consider her as the founding mother of developmental neuropsychology.